Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 9. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Will you join me in this prayer from Richard of Chichester? Thanks be to thee, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits thou hast given me for all the pains and insults thou hast borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly, day by day. Amen. This morning I invite you to imagine that you were going to receive a promotion a promotion that involved you having to leave your current place of work and relocate someplace far, far away. And while you're at it, imagine that you're given one last opportunity to speak to your friends and colleagues at work. What would you say to them? If you had only had one opportunity to speak to them, what would you say? Would you share with them your gratitude and use this as the last opportunity to thank them for their previous years of support and hard work? Would you use that time to recount all the ways that they had shown loyalty to you, may perhaps go from each person to person? Perhaps you might include a couple of anecdotes illustrating how they touched your lives What would you say if you were given the chance? Perhaps you'd be instructive and try to hammer home some key, all-encompassing principles. Would you be sentimental or distant? Would you be positive or negative? Maybe you might be bitter. Or perhaps you'd be gracious. I remember Richard Nixon's farewell to the press following his defeat for governor back in 1962. He had the press gathered around him, and it was, according to him, his last news conference. He was leaving public life, and he said, what a joy you're going to be missing. You won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. That speech made it a little awkward six years later when he came back and announced he was running for president again. (laughs) I remember Dr. Joey Jeter telling us in preaching class that we should never use our last Sundays in the pulpit to say things to our congregation that we didn't have the courage to say to them when we were there with them Sunday after Sunday. What would you say? Would you focus on the past? 
the present, the future, or maybe all three. But now let's turn the heat up a little more. Imagine that you weren't being promoted. Instead, imagine that you were dying, and this was your last chance to speak to your friends and family one last time. When I was at Alito, one of my dear friends was a man named Lynn Ferris. Lynn Ferris was one of the most generous and kind people I'd known in my life. He was a blessing to me when I was there at that church. We'd go for coffee. We'd go for breakfast. I remember one time we went just for coffee to this one restaurant in Weatherford, and he said, now, we're not going to order a lot, but we tip real big. One time, he even gave me his number at the Colonial Country Club, and he said, now, I want you and Terry to use this. And I was nervous about that, and I, we didn't do it. And we were at lunch one time, and he said, now, I'm really upset with you because I gave you that number, and you haven't used it. Well, he was kind of a joker, so I was a little afraid to use it because I thought, what if I give him that number? And they said, this isn't the right number. Um, but he said, I want to see some charges there. We went one time. Lynn was dying of cancer. In fact, it was his last day on earth. And I sat there with him in his home, and I watched him as he said goodbye to each member of his family, even his little grandsons. And I was a blubbering mess. And he looked at me and he said, Mike, we've had a lot of good times, haven't we? And this isn't going to be the end. What would you say if it was your last meeting with people you loved? What would you want them to know? I remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speaking at that rally for the garbage workers in Memphis. The way he talked, it seemed he had some kind of premonition that his time was short. And he used that moment to inspire the people. I've been to the mountaintop, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. How would you say goodbye? What would you say? The scripture reading that you just heard was part of Jesus' goodbye to his disciples. Some call it his last will and testament. And in this passage, Jesus knows that these are his final words to his 12. But also, it's his last words to future generations as well to the church. Last week, the lectionary text was the first part of this discourse in which Jesus tells his disciples that he's the vine and that they are the branches. And like the vine that feeds and nurtures each branch, enabling that branch to bear fruit, Jesus says that he provides the life-giving sustenance that allows us to be faithful, that allows us to bear fruit, to make a difference in our world to say no to the hate and the discord and the backbiting. We discussed that passage in the art and faith class at 10 o'clock, and this was the picture that we used. It's called Christ the Vine. What I love about the picture is that Jesus is depicted as the vine, and then there are Peter and Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jude, James, Bartholomew, Simon, the Zealot, Philip, and Thomas, they're all there as part of the branches. The pictures of each apostle or gospel writer 
represents more than just a person. It represents their mission, their ministry to the world. But it's also, to me, when I looked at it, it's a spiritual family tree. They're the first fruits. But if we were to be able to draw back from that picture after 2,000 years, if you look closely, you'd see First United Methodist Church of Colleyville. And if you looked a little bit closer, you'd see your face there. When Jesus speaks to the disciples in John 15, he's also speaking to us. These last words of Jesus are for us. We're part of this vine. Every good thing we do, every heart we touch, every time we get a mission or ministry right, it all hinges on our connection to Jesus Christ. As Paul said, it's not me but Christ in me. In chapter 15 of John, Jesus said it even better. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So what is Jesus saying in this text? With just a few hours to go before he has to face the cross, what does he want us to remember? Basically, there's just one thing. He says to us, no, no, that's not right, is it? He commands us to love one another. Now, some of you may find that odd, a commandment to love. How can a manner of the heart be subject to command? What control do we have over our ability to love? See, we often confuse love with affection. But in the biblical world, love was about forming attachments, about bonding oneself with another person or another group. You remember the story of Ruth and the deep sense of attachment that Ruth felt toward her mother-in-law, Naomi? So deep was her attachment to Naomi that Ruth, the Moabite woman, left Moab, everything that was familiar to her, everyone who spoke her language, and went to Israel, where as a Moabite, she might not be all that welcome. But she left all that was safe and familiar to her in order to be with the person she loved. She willingly gave up her past and present for an uncertain future in a foreign land with Naomi. Her words of attachment are so beautifully phrased, they almost sound like a wedding vow. In fact, we often hear those words repeated at marriages. Some of you may have had those words said at your wedding. I memorized those words as a child when I was in a Sabbath school class in the Adventist church. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. Whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Attachment. This sense of attachment is how John understands God's love for us. John J. Pilch, in his commentary on this text, writes, God was so attached to humanity that he sent us his son. Jesus, by commanding us to love one another, invites us to become attached to each other in the same way that Jesus is attached to us. This isn't sentimental. The command to love is important. Love in the biblical word was more of a verb than it was a noun. It's something that in order to be real had to be acted out, enfleshed, made visible. In fact, the only form of love that mattered in the Bible was the love that was acted out. 1 John 3 says, little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. 
1 John 4 says, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The love Jesus is talking about doesn't count until it's enacted. And sometimes, even within the church, it's hard to do. Isn't it strange that sometimes the people we know the most are often the easiest or the hardest to love? I mean, we can say we love the people of Africa. We can say we love folks that are out there. But the real hard work, the real nitty-gritty work is being able to say that person across the aisle with whom we disagree, whether it's in Congress or in church, I love them. You probably heard the story about the preacher who was standing outside the sanctuary one time greeting the folks after the sermon. And a couple of kids came down to him, and of course, they were just precious, and he just knelt down, gave each of them a big hug. But then there was this one little boy who was coming a little bit later, and uh, if you remember Pigpen and Charlie Brown, this little boy was kind of like that, you know? He, he, uh, he had uh, whatever he, the snack they had had in Sunday school, he was wearing most of it. Uh, his, he, his nose was running, he'd wet his pants, but having seen the preacher hug those other two boys, he comes up and with a big smile goes like this, and the preacher goes, Ugh. Hiya, kid. <laughs> and the little boy shakes his head, he'll have none of that. No, sir, he said, I won't love with skin on it. And that's the kind of love John is talking about in this text. It's the love that Jesus was that love letter from God. The Word became flesh. The Word was love, was skin on it, and dwelt among us. That's the only kind of love God offers. And that's what the cross was all about. It showed us just how far God was willing to go to show us how much God loved us. Paul says it so well in Romans 8, nothing, neither death, nor life, nor powers, nor principalities, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can personalize that. You can say it can separate you from the love of God. Knowing we're loved like this is where we experience the joy that Jesus talks about in today's passage. One of my favorite things that Grayson, my almost four-year-old nephew, and I enjoy doing is singing a song that I learned in the cradle roll class at the Adventist church when I was just about his age. I'm not sure the official name of the song, but it goes like this. With Grayson in the family, happy, happy home, happy, happy home. Happy, happy home with Grayson in the family. Happy, happy home. Happy, happy home. Boom, boom. Grayson added the boom, booms. Now, now we'll start, we'll sing that, but then he will call out, Mommy. And we have to sing with Mommy in the family. Sometimes we don't even get through with Mommy before he says, Daddy. We, well, mommy, Daddy. Sometimes we have to do Mommy, Daddy, Caden, Micah. Pickles, donuts, it, it, it can really expand quite a bit. Even his, even his teddy bear that he named Puppy. But whenever his little brother Micah is around, we have to sing that song using Micah's name. We're usually sitting, I'm usually sitting on the couch, and I'm holding Micah, and Grayson is right beside me, and we're sort of bouncing Micah up, with Micah in the family, happy, happy home. And Micah gets the biggest smile on his face. All four teeth, upper and lower, are just shining. Now, he's barely one. He doesn't understand what we're saying. He's still speaking angel. But he picks up on the love that's in our voices. 
and he smiles and he laughs. He's experiencing the joy of being loved unconditionally. He knows he's part of the family. And that's what Jesus is saying to his church, to his people. You know, and I've always really been most comfortable with the idea of the church as a family or as a home, especially when you use Robert Frost's definition of home as the place that when you get there, they have to take you in. That's where you find true joy. That joy embraces everyone in this room. Nobody is outside that love. Last week, one of the children in the 1111 service showed me his brand new Under Armour running shoes. He told me that with those shoes, he can now run faster and jump farther than ever before. In fact, they are so good, he said, he can jump a whole sidewalk square. Well, those are great shoes. But as fast as they make him, he'll never be able to outlove the run of God. It will always be there for him. It's embedded in his DNA, and it's the same for you. Think about the person in your life who loved you the most. You see a face? You remember how they would react when they saw you? How they would just jump up with joy? The look on their faces? For them, you were, at least they made you feel like you were the only person in the room. They doted on you. They bragged on you. They believed in you, even when you didn't believe in yourself. And they always had your back. Even when you did wrong, they were there to help you talk it through, to figure out how to make things right. It was never adversarial or judgy. They loved you, and whatever they said... You heard it, and you took it to heart. Well, whoever that person may be, I want you to understand, God loves you infinitely more than that person. In fact, when God looks at you, God doesn't see some groveling, worthless creature. God sees a son or daughter created in God's image. You're not a mistake. To reject you would be for God to reject a part of who God is. God wants to be in relationship with you, to share your joys and sorrows, to give your life meaning and focus. Several years ago, I had the honor of preaching the baccalaureate service at my former high school, and I used this text for that service, focusing on the line, I don't call you servants any longer because the servant doesn't know what the master is doing. I have called you my friends. It seemed to me that in that statement, the disciples experienced a sort of graduation ceremony in their relationship with Jesus, from slaves to friends. Later, after Pentecost, they were sent into the world to share all that Jesus had poured into them. Now, even though I had preached that at a baccalaureate, at the time, I never really considered the implications of Jesus calling us friends. I've sung that hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, but it, what really struck me, it, it hit me differently this time. And uh, it reminded me that when I took that preaching class with Fred Craddock, he told us about when he was a graduate student at Vanderbilt, they had a Jewish studies program, and there was a seminar class where all the Jewish students met with the professor, who was also a rabbi. The seminar would begin with the first, second, and third-year students all gathered together, but at a certain point, the rabbi would dismiss the first-year students and continue to teach with the second-year and third-year students. And then he would pause at a certain point and dismiss the second-year students. And once the second-year students were out, he addressed those who were remaining, the seniors, and he said, and now my colleagues. Can you imagine the thrill of your professor saying, calling you a colleague? But imagine you're reclining on the floor around that table where you've just had 
the Passover meal with Jesus. And he looks at you and he calls you his friend. We're 2,000 years, give or take, from that night, but we're part of that vine. And when Jesus calls his disciples his friends, he's saying we're his friends too. How does that make you feel? You're Jesus' friend. That's an elite group. Outside of this passage, there are only two people that are mentioned in Scripture as friends of God. The first is Abraham, that grand old patriarch who left his home and all that was familiar to settle in a place God would reveal at another time. He was the father of Israel, a man of incomparable faith and obedience. But there it is in Isaiah 41. God calls Abraham friend. The other person was Moses, but his place as friend, his designation as friend is a little less explicit. In Exodus 33, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses as one speaks to a friend. But I still think that counts. Two people in the entire Hebrew Bible are designated as God's friend, and aside from David, they tower over all the other people in the Hebrew Scriptures. Again, what does it mean for you to hear that you're included? You're Jesus' friend. Craddock, in his sermon on this text, zoomed in on that image as Jesus, uh, as us being Jesus' friend, he said, suddenly and shockingly, Jesus bestows the title that no one among us could claim, friend. It feels like a title, but in fact, the word describes a relationship. It implies love and mutuality. Even if it's not a title, it still feels like a title. If you've been all your life a servant of Jesus... If you've chosen that role, if being a servant of Jesus, faithful in word and deed, has been the total definition of who you are, then to be called by Jesus his friend is an overwhelming gift. Jesus has called me his friend. Who can pronounce the words? It's too much. And Craddock referenced the song we just sang as our opening hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And you notice in that hymn, we list some of the ways that Jesus is a friend to us, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our troubles share, sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. In his arms, he'll take and shield you. You'll find a solace there. But then I thought, when Jesus sings, what a friend I have in Michael, what does he sing about? How have I been his friend? The only thing Jesus asks of us in his final words is that we love one another, not judge, not condemn, not assume the worst, but love. But that's enough. Paul even says love fulfills the law. Love can change the world. The Beatles were right after all. All you need is love. While the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to the Apostle John, St. Jerome, who translated the Bible from Greek to Latin, tells us that as an old man, John would visit his churches, repeating the same messages over and over again. Little children, love one another, love one another, love one another. And when asked why he always gave the same answer, he said, because it's the Lord's commandment. And if that's all we ever do, it's enough. Amen.